What's going on guys? We're having a great day today. A few weeks ago we were looking at Job chapter 3 and we saw the very first time that Job spoke after his afflictions, right? They had seven days of silence and that Job in chapter 3 speaks and he actually laments his birth. He curses the day he was born and he mourns because of his birth, because of the agony he's experiencing. As we move forward, we're going to be in Job 4 today. We're going to read all 21 verses in the chapter 4 uh, in the book of Job. And here we're going to see the very first friend that speaks for Job, that speaks toward Job, and it's Eliphaz. So we see Eliphaz speaking. And in, in this chapter, Eliphaz speaks some, some wise things, but we must understand that he is saying these things in an accusatory manner against Job, saying that Job is, it has sinned, and that's why these things are happening to Job. But we must understand that we find out in the very first chapter of Job that Job is, is a perfect man, a blameless man. He is one who fears the Lord and turns from evil. And so because of that, although what Eliphaz is saying, I think can be applied in a general sense, we must understand that the context that he is speaking in an accusatory manner against Job is, is wrong. And also because he is speaking in a generalization, although it can be generalized, and we're looking at some other scriptures that kind of support what he is saying, we must understand that, that what he is saying is not 100% applicable to every single situation. And so that's important to understand. But as we read chapter 4, this is what Eliphaz says in the book of Job. Then Eliphaz the Tamanite answered and said, If we essay to commune with thee, will thou be grieved? But who can withhold him from speaking? Behold, thou hast instructed me, and thou hast strengthened the weak hands. The words have upholded him that was falling, and thou hast strengthened the feeble knees. But now it is come upon thee, and thou faintest. It touches thee, and thou art troubled. Is not this thy fear, thy confidence, thy hope, and thy uprightness of thy ways? Remember, I pray thee, whoever perished being innocent, or where were the righteous cut off? Even as I have seen, they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. By the blast of God they perish, and by the breath of his nostrils are they consumed. The roaring of the lion and the voice of the fierce lion and the teeth of the young lions are broken. The oldest lion perisheth for lack of prey, and the stout lion's whelps are scattered abroad. Now a thing was secretly brought to me, and mine ear received a little thereof, and thoughts from the visions of the night when deep sleep falleth on men. Fear came upon me, and trembling which made all my bones to shake, then a spirit passed before my face, the hair of my flesh stood up. It stood still, but I could not discern the form thereof. An image was before mine eyes. There was silence, and I heard a voice saying, Shall mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? Behold, he put no trust in his servants, and his angels he charged with folly. How much less in them that dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, which are crushed before the moth. They are destroyed from morning to evening. They perish forever without any regarding it. Doth not their excellency which is in them go away? They die even without wisdom. So we look at verse 2. First of all, in verse 1 we see that Eliphaz is the one speaking, right? But then verse 2 it says, Eliphaz is basically, can I speak to you? I know you're greed, but who cannot speak to you, right? He wants to speak to Job. Now, he wants to pour out wisdom to Job. He actually kind of wants to accuse Job based off what he's saying. But he's basically saying, Job, who cannot speak to you in this time of grief? And when can we speak to you is basically kind of what he's asking him. And then in verse 3, he actually tells Job, he, in a sense, he gives Job a backsided compliment, right? He's saying, Behold, thou hast instructed many, and thou hast strengthened the weak hands. Thy words have upholded him that was falling, and thou hast strengthened the feeble knees. So he's giving a Job a compliment, that you are wise, Job, and you have strengthened many with your words, that you have benefited people, you have poured wisdom and knowledge into people's lives, and it has benefited them, it has strengthened their hands, it has strengthened their knees, right? So he's giving Job a compliment. But here in verse 5, he's going to give him a, a, the backside of part of the compliment. But now it has come upon thee, and thou faintest. It toucheth thee, and thou art troubled. Saying, you are wise, you have poured wisdom to these people. But now that calamity has come upon you, now that you are dealing with these troubles, and these trials, and, these, and this calamity, now that you are on the receiving end of these misfortunes, what do you have to say? He says, thou faintest. It touched thee, and thou art troubled. That, that your wisdom can help people, but your own wisdom is not able to sustain you in this regard and I really don't think he's correct in this manner I mean really what happened to Job is so serious and so far I mean yes we see Job curse his birth which I don't think was a good thing for him to do but so far Job has not cursed God so far Job has not blamed God and that Job is still maintaining his integrity and even through chapter 4 so I really think Eliphaz he's giving him a backside of compliments right he's, he's telling him truth hey you have strengthened people with your words but you can't strengthen yourself but really, I think Job is, all things considered, doing a great job as, as far as being holding fast to his integrity, being faithful 
to God. And then in verse 6, it's very interesting. He says, Is not this thy fear, thy confidence, thy hope, and thy uprightness of thy ways? Now, actually, the ESV says, Is not your fear of God your confidence? So, I'm not sure exactly where the, the Greek, and, or the, excuse me, the Hebrew, would actually meet in order to get that relation. But, basically what he's saying is, Hey, your fear and your confidence, they, they come in the Lord, right? So, you are to, to glorify God. So, Job's fear of God is his strength and his hope. And and that's really should be true for all Christians, right? That we we fear God in, in a good way. We revere God. We worship God. We praise God. And that we are dependent, utterly, utterly dependent upon God. And that God is our strength. He is our hope. That we hope in God, especially the return of Christ. So even when we go through these trials and these tribulations, we can look toward Christ, look towards His coming, and, and have joy and have peace and have comfort, even through difficult situations in our life. And then here's a very interesting part that Eliphaz speaks, right? This is where it's going to be very interesting because Eliphaz is speaking semi-wise things, right? What he's going to be saying in verse 7 through 11 are wise things. They're things that in, in general can be applied. And I'm going to show you some other scriptures in the Bible that kind of support what he's saying. But the problem with this is that Job, as we see in chapter 1, is a blameless man. And he's using this to, to accuse Job of sin. Therefore, this is why it's happening to him. So that's why what Eliphaz says is sort of wise but in a general application, it can't be applied to Job in this regard. But anyway, in verse 7, he says, Remember, I pray that whoever perished, being innocent, right? Whoever has perished, who, what innocent person has ever perished? Or where were the righteous cut off, right? That righteous people aren't cut off. Innocent people aren't perished, or they don't perish. He says, Even as I have seen, they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same, right? People who, who do sin, people who are rebellious against God, and they sow wickedness, they sow sin, and they just keep sinning. They're going to do, or and they keep doing bad things, they're going to reap bad things as well. Is basically what Eliphaz is saying here, right? They sow wickedness, and they reap the same. And so he says, By the blast of God they perish, and by the breath of his nostrils are they consumed. And here in verse 10 and verse 11, he just uses the, the metaphor of a lion to kind of say the same thing. But we see that he's saying that the wickedness they receive, by the blast of God they perish, right? That God punishes the wicked, and that's a true statement. There's nothing wrong about that, that statement that God does pour out his wrath upon the wicked. God does punish those who are wicked. Right? And those who, who do wickedness will actually reap wickedness. They're gonna reap evil because they're doing evil. And like I said, this is a true statement. It's a, a very general statement, but Job has done nothing wrong in this scenario. So it can't be applied to every situation. Because if you just say, This bad thing has happened to this person, therefore they must have done something bad then you're really not trusting in the sovereignty and the providence of God. Like in this situation, God is just testing Job. God is proving, not that he has to, but he's proving Job, right? He's testing Job's heart, testing Job, Job's trust in him. And he's really making a mockery of the devil by showing him how foolish he is, how foolish the devil is, and showing him that Job truly does love the Lord. But if we look at Proverbs chapter 11, verse 18 through 19, it says this, The wicked worketh a deceitful work. But to him that soweth righteousness shall be a sure reward. As righteousness tendeth to life, so that he so he that pursueth evil pursueth it to his own death. Right, so the people those who are righteous will have a reward, right? They will they will have a life, they'll have a good life, those who are righteous. Then it says those that pursueth evil pursueth it to his own death. So those are that are doing wickedness, that are practicing iniquity, those who are doing evil actively, are really working their way to their death. That that, that the wickedness that they are doing is going to be their death, going to be their demise. So we see a truth in what Eliphaz is saying. But then we also get Proverbs chapter 22, verse 8, and it says, He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity, and the rod of his anger shall fail. So if you are constantly sinning, you are doing wickedness, you're going to bring evil and, and destruction upon yourself. I mean, it's, it's it doesn't take a genius to understand that people who are alcoholics, people who are getting drunk very often, are damaging their liver. They're damaging their whole body, and it's going to lead to a quicker death. Right, and we see people who drink and drive. It's just, it's just common sense that that doing wickedness, in, ge in a general sense, will lead to your death quicker. Obviously, there are other factors that can cause somebody to die that may not be that their own accord. But the general sense is there that if you're doing wickedness, expect to receive evil upon yourself as well. But again, we must remember that Job is blameless in this regard. But if we also look at Ezekiel chapter 18, starting at verse 24, God says this. But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness, and committeth iniquity, and doeth according to all the abominations that wicked that the wicked man doeth, shall he live, 
all his righteousness that he had done shall not be mentioned, and his trespass that he hath trespassed, and his sin that he hath sinned, and sin, or in them shall he die. Yet you say, The way of the Lord is not equal. Here now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal, or not your ways unequal. When a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness, and committeth iniquity, and dieth in them, for his iniquity that he hath done shall he die. Again, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed, and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. Because he considereth and turneth away from all his transgressions that he hath committed, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Yet say the house of Israel, the way of the Lord is not equal. O house of Israel, are not my ways equal? Are not your ways unequal? So we see in the same regard where God is speaking. right? Those who do wickedness are going to die because of their wickedness. But then in the same way, those who turn to God will have God's righteousness put upon them. And we see that in the New Testament, right? And that we're saved by Christ. But anyway, those who are doing good, in a general sense, will reap good. Now, obviously, this can't be applied to every specific application as we see in Job's life. But it's just a general understanding that, that doing wickedness is going to lead to evil. And then doing good is going to lead, more than likely, to good. Even if you don't necessarily receive anything good, you're honoring God. You're, you're giving glory to God through your actions, being obedient to God. And therefore, it is a good thing to do, so we should all strive to do that. And now in verse 12 to verse 16, it's very interesting. We, we see that, that Eliphaz is talking about how his spirit came to him and revealed stuff to him. Right? He said, Now a thing was secretly brought to me, and my ear received a little thereof. Fear came upon me, and trembling which made all my bones shake. Then a spirit passed before my face. The hair of my flesh stood up. And it stood still, but I could not discern the form thereof. An image was before my eyes. There was silence, and I heard a voice saying. So we don't know what this spirit is. We don't know if it was a... You know, if it was an angel, if it was a, a demonic spirit, or if possibly it was the Holy Spirit. We, we don't know. Um, so therefore, I'm not going to make a strong case on that. But we just know, and who, who knows, Eliphaz could be lying. I, I don't think he is. But really, there's no indication of what this spirit actually is. He just says it's a spirit that, that spoke to him while he was sleeping, right? When deep sleep falleth on men. And so we that's all we know. But basically, the important part is what does he hear this spirit say, right? He says, Shall mortal men be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? Behold, he put no trust in his servants, and his angels he charged with folly. How much less in them that dwelleth in houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, which are crushed before the moth. So basically, Eliphaz is saying, this spirit told him, like, that God has created all things, right? Shall mortal men be more just than God? Right? Shall a man be more pure than his maker, so that we are made by God? And and the short answer is no. We're obviously not good as God is good. We're not righteous as God is righteous. We're not holy and pure as God is holy and pure. We have all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. All right? So there is no one good because we've all sinned against God. But again, Eliphaz is using this statement, this true statement, this broad statement, to say Job is experiencing this calamity because of his sin against God. But we know that's not true. So basically he's saying, look, Job, we have all sinned. We have all fallen short of God's glory. Nobody can be more just than God. Nobody can be um, pure as his maker is pure. Therefore, I know you've sinned, Job, so what sin have you done for this calamity to come upon you? Is basically what Eliphaz is, is kind of expounding to him, right? So while what he's saying is true to Job, again, it is not applied to Job. And that's why we can't use these, these true generalizations to specify specific things in people's lives. But then also he says something interesting. He says, in his angels he charged with folly. Talking about the, the fallen angels. Right? And then in verse 19, I think it's just, in them that dwells the houses of clay, whose foundation is the dust. I think it's just talking about human uh, human beings right there. So I think the whole consensus of Job chapter 4 is Eliphaz is saying some wise things. Right? Yes, the wicked will not go unpunished. Right? Yes, we have all sinned. Yes, God is holy. He is pure. And he is just. These are true things. These are biblical things. But the problem is Eliphaz is using them in a manner. These true generalizations, he is using them to declare that Job has sinned. Therefore, this is calamity is coming upon him. That he is being directly punished because of some grievous sin that he committed. And we know that's not true. So because what Eliphaz is saying, although it's, it's true, although it sounds good, in relation to his heart, to his message towards Job, Eliphaz is, is judging incorrectly. Eliphaz is wrong in his assessment. But again, we, we, we know that he's wrong in that because Job is perfect. Um, that Job is perfect in this sense. that He's not being punished for a sin that he's committed. But I really do want to emphasize what Eliphaz says and, and the truth of what he said. Right here in verse 17, Shall mortal men be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? 
And like I mentioned earlier, the answer is no. See, the truth of, of the gospel is that we have all sinned. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. That you have sinned, I have sinned. We have all rebelled against God and broken his holy law, broken his commandments. And the truth is that there is no one good. Because of our sin against a holy God, we are separate from God. And as we mentioned that the, the wicked will not go unpunished, that we, have, we are all wicked. We all deserve God's wrath. And God's wrath will be poured out upon all those who do not believe in him. But that God loved us enough to send his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christ humbled himself. He put on flesh. He became a man. He lived a perfect, sinless, holy, good life. One that we could never live. And that in his perfection, Christ went to the cross. That he was not worthy of death. That no man could take his life from him. That he willingly laid his life down upon the cross. And the wrath that you and I deserve because of our sin was poured out upon Christ. And that Christ took it upon himself. Christ died upon that cross. His blood was spelt upon that cross. And so he died. He ro- and he was buried. But he, on the third day he rose again. Proving that he is God. And that what he said is true. And that Christ has made a way for us to be saved. That if you place your trust in Christ. You repent of your sins. You believe in him as Lord and Savior. You say Lord I, I cannot offer anything good to be saved. But I wholly trust in the finished work upon cr- the, the cross that Christ accomplished. That it's not my goodness, but it's the goodness of Christ. It's the righteousness of Christ. It's the blood of Christ that washes away my sins. And you believe that. You trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You will be saved. You won't be considered wicked in God's eyes because the righteousness of Christ will cover you. And that you will be you will be declared righteous. Not because of anything that you have done, but because of what Christ has done for us. So that if anybody would repent of their sins and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they will be saved. Ours, Mary, you are not alone. Jesus loves you. I love you. Have a blessed rest of your day.